There's some really brave and unique people in the world. And sometimes those brave and unique people find each other and band together to form communities. And in this video, we are going to look at 10 of the most unique communities in the world. Number one, Miracle Village. Miracle Village is a town that's found out in the middle of nowhere in the sugarcane fields of Palm Beach County, Florida. And this place was founded by a pastor named Richard Witherow to be a community specifically designed for registered sex offenders. It was founded in 2009 and it is the largest community of them in the United States states with over 200 residents. Pastor Witherow has been ministering to sex offenders for decades and he founded this town to help provide a solution for registered sex offenders who are having difficulty finding a place to live. However, living in this place is not always easy. They have very strict rules and regulations to make sure that it doesn't turn into just a den of badness. A lot of them have to wear GPS monitors. They're not allowed to have cell phones. They have curfews and there's a strict application process to make sure that they would actually be a fit in the community and that they want to change. And currently Miracle Village, because they have had so much success with seeing lives change, they've run out of room and have begun expanding into the nearby town. Number two, San Pedro Prison in La Paz, Bolivia is a prison that sells cocaine base to sustain itself. It has a thriving tourism industry and houses women and children. This prison doesn't even seem like a real place, but it is. And it's also notoriously one of the most corrupt prisons in the world. It's common knowledge that if you want a tour of the place, all you got to do is slip the prison guards a little money and they will let you right in. And as souvenirs, like gift shop souvenirs, they sell cocaine base. I'll be honest, I have no idea what that actually is, but I know it's not exactly a tube of Toblerone chocolate. What do you want from the gift shop, little Timmy? Cocaine base. And yeah, Lil Timmy's there. San Pedro Prison is also unique because prisoners are allowed to bring in their families to live with them and also to buy and sell prison cells. And the place even has its own social caste system. There are the super poor, like the slums of the prison. And then there are the super wealthy. There are legitimately luxury cells in this prison. There are restaurants, hotels for the tourists, and even a hospital within the walls. Oh, and remember that cocaine base they sell? Well, not surprisingly, they have a whole cocaine lab within the prison, which apparently everybody knows about and nobody cares. They make and traffic cocaine out of the prison. They warn tourists, and I still can't believe they're tourists, not to go out at night because there are regular stabbings. You know, because of all the cocaine addicts. At least the local child care center makes sure the kids are doing their schoolwork. The most infamous drug trafficker in Colombia, whose name is Redbeard. When he was finally arrested, he was so unhappy with this cell, he used his drug money to build a new story onto the prison where he had his own luxury cell with a jacuzzi and cable TV. Number three, the prince Principality of Sealand. Sealand is a micronation that was founded in 1966 by a man named Patty Roy Bates and his wife Joan. This happened on Christmas Eve. He was trying to think of a great Christmas present for his wife Joan and you think, hey, why not a country? So he took his wife out on a boat, full on ninja style, threw a grappling hook up onto an abandoned aircraft carrier, climbed up and declared it the Principality of Sealand and gave it to his wife as a Christmas present. There was a man and a daughter living on this abandoned aircraft carrier. They were running a pirate radio program and Patty and his wife forced them out of the aircraft carrier and said it was theirs now. And then Patty and Joan proceeded to take over the pirate radio station and make it their own. With no regard for the father and daughter who had been living there before them. And here's the crazy thing. Since the 1970s, you've been able to become a citizen of Sealand. You can get a passport, become a duke or a duchess, and it has gotten crazy there sometimes. In 1978, one of the Sealand citizens, a German man who called himself the Prime Minister of Sealand, hired mercenaries to assault the aircraft carrier in an attempt at a hostile takeover. Patty and Joan then got their rifles out and fought them off. And then, of course, declared this man, whose name was Alexander Achenbach to be a traitor and now exiled from Sealand unless he paid a fine of $35,000. And then in 1997, a money laundering ring appeared using Sealand passports and documents as a way to trick people into their scheme. They had sold 4,000 fake Sealand passports, even though the real ones aren't recognized by anyone, for $1,000 a piece. Roy and Joan Bates have both passed on since then, but their son Michael, the Prince of Sealand, is still in command. Number four, Whittier, Alaska. Did you ever graduate college, leave the dorm life, and think, I wish I could do this forever? 
Well, that's what's happened in Whittier, Alaska. It's a town of almost 300 people and pretty much all of the residents live in a single building. And they're really serious about keeping everything contained. There are two main buildings in this place. The main complex, which has 150 different apartments, and then the local school for the kids. And they're connected by an underground tunnel for bad weather days because... Alaska. Number five, Olafsfjorder. Olafsfjorder. Olafsfjorder? Fjorder? I don't know. It's a town of about 800 people located in Iceland, and in the summer they have 31 consecutive days where the sun never sets. Imagine this. You and your special friend decide to go out and watch the sunset as people do. You're sitting there, you watch the sun start to go down, and you're thinking to yourself, here we go. The hours go by 10, 11, 12, 1 a.m. hits. The sun is right at the horizon and you're like, this is going to get good. And then all of a sudden to your horror, the sun is just about to go down and then it starts to come right back up and it never gets truly dark. And you have to live this nightmare for 31 days straight. And the people who live there, of course, love it and have all kinds of legends and mythologies about their beloved town. Number six, Cappadocia. This is one that I I've actually spent some time in myself and it is one of my favorite places in the world. In the first few hundred years AD, Cappadocia was originally a place where Christians fled persecution. And in order to hide from their persecutors, they dug hundreds of miles of tunnels underground and full-blown cities. They have cities that go five stories underground. They have full-blown churches and crypts inside. But as time went by and it got safer, these Christians dug homes out of the caves. And now there's a whole community of people that continue to live in these cave homes. And it's a really popular tourist attraction now. Every morning, hot air balloons go up and you can take some of the most incredible pictures you'll ever see. And there are cave hotels where you can go and sleep in a cave. It's amazing. Number seven, Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. This unique little town of almost 300 people is the most remote permanent settlement on earth. It is 1,500 miles from the next nearest populated area. It was originally a military garrison that was established in the 1800s to stop the French from attempting to rescue Napoleon while he was in exile. And from there, it continued to form into an actual community until 1961, when a volcano erupted and forced the entire population to evacuate. And they returned two years later in 1963 to build what the town is now. If you want to visit, you better make sure to pack your bags for a while, because the only way to get there is by boat, and only about 10 ships go there a year. And because most of those ships are for the locals, you have have to book months in advance just to get a seat. There are some Airbnb style houses, but there are no hotels for you to stay in. It's not exactly the most tourist friendly place. Oh, hey, since you're watching, why not hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you can be notified when I put up some new videos? Because they're gonna be good. Number eight, Wadi Al Salam. This place in Iraq is a gigantic city that contains the world's largest cemetery. The city itself of Najaf has about one and a half million people in population and right there with it is a 1500 acre cemetery that contains over 8 million bodies. As the story goes, there was an imam named Ali who was worried that his grave would be desecrated after he died, so he asked to be buried in secret. However, after he died, his burial location became known and so his followers wanted to be buried near him. This was 1300 years ago and people have continued to be buried around him since then. Many Muslims consider this to be the third holiest place in Islam. And to this day, there are an estimated 200 bodies being buried there every single day. Number eight, Nagoro Village, also known as Nagoro Doll Village. In this small village in Japan, a local woman named Tsukimi Ayano, whose name I'm sure I am butchering, and I apologize for that, was feeling lonely because all of the people in her village were either leaving seeking jobs or just dying off from old age. She didn't want to be all by herself in town, so she did the only healthy thing you can do. Start building life-size dolls and putting them in the places where your friends and family used to be. She made the first doll while working in her garden and thought, I should make one that looks like my dad. So she did that and the flame was lit. She started making more and more of these dolls and now they're all over the village. She's made dolls and put them in the school classrooms, out on the bridge fishing, taking a stroll, people sitting on a bus stop bench waiting for a bus that will never come. And some of the former residents have even returned and brought their own clothes to put on the dolls that represent them. And right now, there are roughly 400 dolls in the town and about 25 inhabitants. 
Number 10, Noiva de Cordeiro. In the southeast of Brazil, there's a town with a population of about 600, and they are almost all women. It all started in 1891 when a woman was accused of adultery, when in fact she was fleeing from a man that she was being forced to marry that she didn't love. And because other women were being forced to marry men they didn't want to, they banded together and formed a community. However, there were some men in that community at that time. As a matter of fact, it was a man who started a church and married one of the girls when she was only 16 years old. He then proceeded to impose all kinds of strict laws that the women didn't really agree with but didn't know what to do about. And this man basically became their leader until 1995 when he died. And as soon as he died, the women came together once again, but this time decided not to let men be in command anymore. So they formed this community where only women are allowed to live in town, the women are in charge, they govern everything, and men do not have a vote. Now this of course does not mean that they don't have men in their lives. Many of them actually have husbands husbands and families. As a matter of fact, in 2013, there was such a lack of men in the community that they sent out a public appeal asking men to come to town because they wanted to get married. However, the men are only allowed to be in town on the weekend. During the week, they gotta be out. Thanks for watching. Please make sure to subscribe and give me a thumbs up. See you in the next video.